Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Turn your Bibles to Jonah. We're going to be in Jonah. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. Actually, we're going to go to Jonah 3 and 4 because it just makes more sense if we cover them together. And so um, I'm praying that we can accomplish this in the time that we have left. Uh, so Jonah 3 and 4. And I was talking to some friends this week and some, some of those who came to my office. And we were talking about this the powerful story of and the message in, in chapter 2. And something stuck out to me that I just want to reiterate. I noticed in the scripture that God showed mercy to Jonah when he was disobedient. In the way that, and this is how he did it. God sent a large fish to swallow him up, and then Jonah had a conversation with God. That is incredible grace and mercy, isn't it? And we're going to see that God shows mercy before even the Ninevites begin to repent. We're going to see that today. But what I see in Scripture is God shows mercy before you even recognize it. And then when you do recognize it, you go, well, I need to respond to this. And we, that's what God wants us to do is respond. And where am I getting this from? The scripture says kindness, his kindness leads us to repentance. God will be kind and merciful so that we will repent. And so God was kind and merciful to Jonah and he repented. And now the Ninevites, they're going to have the same experience and uh, just, just amazing to rethink that and just to reflect on that. And so let's get into Jonah chapter 3. I want to jump right in. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time, thank God, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh a city so large that it took three days to see it all. But on the day Jonah entered the city, he, he started preaching right away. He, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now, just so you know, theologians and scholars believe that there was more to the message than just that. This was a summary of what he would have said. And it was a warning that this city would be destroyed unless, well, you repent, unless you turn from your wicked ways. But that's all we have recorded here. Some would say that this is it. Some would say that there's more to it. It is not uncommon for writers and authors of these books to not give you all the details because it could have been a long message. It could have been just a little bit more, or it could have been this. I would lean into the fact that there was probably more than this, but if there wasn't, this would be enough because God can convict as the word is being preached. Are you following me here? Great. So the people of Nineveh, verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God's message. And from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. What we see in this first paragraph is that the mission of God didn't change. Jonah had to change. The message of God didn't change. And God gives him the same message to say, and he goes and delivers it, and it works. And God is showing mercy to this city before they even repent, because to give them 40 days is to like give them a period and a season of grace to respond to this message. This is something that would be uh, 40 days in the scripture is mentioned when it comes to testing and trials and to see if anything would change. So this is consistent with other places in scripture that God is giving them a chance to repent. And so they begin their journey of repenting. And I love that this uh, is God's message. It's not Jonah's. God gave this message to Jonah. God's message gets the work done. And that's the same today. So let's go further into verse 6. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. 
He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. Wow. In this portion of our story, the king actually verifies and affirms their ruthless and violent reputation. He says, stop all of your violence. We must stop all of our violence. So the reputation that the Ninevites have, the king just admitted it. And he's saying, let's stop. And we have four signs that they began to repent. The first thing is they changed their appearance by wearing clothes associated with mourning and humility. And this included a posture of sitting in the dust or on a heap of ashes. They declared a fast among the people. And this is interesting. They must have been very desperate to even say, don't feed your animals. And then he said, pray fervently, pray to God. And lastly, he says, turn from evil ways and specifically from all violence. What we see here in this text is that repentance wasn't just a show of, I'm going to change my clothing. It goes even to change your actions. Repentance isn't just a show. It's a prolonged, long distance change of behavior And the king acknowledges something important here. If perhaps if we do this, God will relent. He'll hold back his wrath. He'll change his mind and he won't destroy us. So even the king of Nineveh realizes that they must change their ways. And it's going to be up to God. We're at the mercy of God's hand, whether we're going to be forgiven or not. That is interesting that this king acknowledges that being that he's a pagan king. How does God respond? Well, it says in verse 10, when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind or he relented in other versions and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. What we see here is, is that God is a merciful God who responds to contrite and repentant hearts and if we're humble, he will respond. And, and the king even acknowledged though, that it's up to God whether he's going to do that or not. Now, this is consistent as well in other places in Scripture. And I'm going to give you one. I'll read it. It won't be on the screen for you, but I have it here and on my notes online. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. It says this, If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed but then that nation renounces its evil ways, I would not destroy it as I had planned. And if I announce that I will plant and build up a certain nation or kingdom, but then that nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me, I will not bless it as I said I would. Wow. You know, that's Israel, right? In the Old Testament. God said, I will bless you. I will bless you. You will be a blessing to others. But God pulls back his blessing because they were so evil and wicked and had forgotten God. Hence the reason Jeremiah is saying these things, the prophet. Hence the reason that that, uh, Jonah, this whole story of Jonah is an illustration of how Israel has shown no mercy to other people. And yet God shows Israel mercy time and time again. It's interesting to see that in other places in Scripture. Let's go to chapter four, because this is fascinating to me. God holds back his wrath and punishment, and you would think that Jonah would be happy. Right? Let's celebrate. I mean, he doesn't know this, but in other places in scripture for us, we know that all of heaven is celebrating when how many people turn to the Lord? One. A city of around 120 people, probably even more if it was just the children they were referring to, 
120,000 people are now turning to God and God is sparing them. There should be a party going on. And instead, Jonah turns to anger at the Lord's mercy. Um, I will have to tell you this. This is one of the most, I'm, I made up this word, cringiest <laughs> conversations. I looked it up. I literally, I was like, can I use cringiest? And it doesn't even exist. The most uncomfortable conversation you will probably ever read in the Bible, I think it's the most uncomfortable that you will ever read between God and man. There may be some more out there. This one is awkward to read. And it's, it's uncomfortable because we know how God treated Jonah in the previous chapter. And I kind of wonder, can we forget how good God is that fast? Maybe we do. Maybe mankind, maybe we forget how faithful and good God has been. In fact, um, not, I'm not saying we do that, but next week we're going to have a special service. This is why I'm trying to cover two chapters today. We're going to have a special service of reflecting on all that God is doing in this church and we're going to celebrate, and we're going to praise God. We need to do that in the midst of what's going on, too. But then next Sunday night is our prayer night, so, on, so during the day, we're going to praise God and give him thanks, but at night, we're going to have an intense prayer meeting in this room for our world, for healings, for salvations to take place next Sunday night. But I'm looking forward to celebrating next week. So hardest to read, let's read it. This is one of the hardest to read. This change of plans, verse 1, greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. In the Hebrew, it means to be hot with anger. He's furious. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarsus. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing Love, you are eager to turn back from destroying people. Now, if I'm God, I'm going, I'm kind of wondering if he's like, like, I'm kind of wondering if, if God's like, well, this is awkward because you just gave me a really, really nice compliment. And you're angry about that. And he says, just kill me now, Lord. If there was anyone near Jonah, I'm pretty sure they left. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. And the Lord replies justly and fairly, is it right for you to be angry about this? Is it right? Wow, that is a scary, scary moment, in my opinion, uh, to be in. Ironically, in the midst of Jonah's brutally honest admission, he gives one of the most encouraging statements in the Old Testament about the character of God. It's used numerous times in Scripture. In other words, Jonah knew the character of God. Jonah knew his theology. And it was used so many times, and he's practically quoting Exodus chapter 34 here, verse 6. God is a merciful, compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. This is in the face of so many critics who say God is such a mean God in the Old Testament. And I always show them this story because God is not a mean God. God is a just God. And God is a merciful God. And when he must show mercy or when he wants to show mercy, he does. And when there must be destruction, there will be destruction because he knows it should take place. It's just God. And he gets to be God. You know what's interesting about Jonah? Jonah knew his theology, but he did not follow or live by it. Oh, Lord, help us to not have all the answers in Scripture, to not, to not know everything and to have the best knowledge but not live it. Let us be convicted that we live what we know to be true. Jonah is saying this is a matter of fact. 
God, you are this compassionate. You are this gracious. You relent. You're, you're slow to anger. How many love the fact that God is slow to anger? <laughs> Jonah's experiencing that. Because there should have been a lightning bolt that just came down on him. Request granted. Goodbye, Jonah. <laughs> it's so ironic that this is happening. So let's keep going. And we're now, uh, just so you know, in verse 4, um, theologians say that Jonah ran away again. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Verse 5, then Jonah went out to the east side of the city. The conversation ended. Jonah, what are you doing, man? Last time you got swallowed by a fish. You got thrown into an ocean. What are you doing? Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. We know that he was hoping it would be destroyed. God's already exposed that part. And it says in verse 6, And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful, or in other versions, exceedingly glad. Wow. Once again, God shows mercy by not striking him dead and answering his prayer request. And then gives him a leafy plant to help give him shade so he's not uncomfortable. And finally, Jonah is happy. Does this scream selfishness or what? It does. Trust me, I'm not trying to beat up Jonah. We're just reading it as fact. Jonah is being selfish here. And it's all about him. But God, <laughs> but God, verse 7, also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. So we, we know that God arranged a fish. Now in this one moment, we have God arranging three things, his sovereignty at work, his authority over creation. And what's interesting about these is that God in one way can build and, and deliver, and now another way God can destroy. He's showing his authority and sovereignty that he can do this. This is powerful. God even uses little worms or large fish. And the one who has their free will to work is not really working well with God. Did he obey? Yes. But did he do it with the right spirit? No. You know, this is why I titled the message, Jonah Goes to Mercy School. <laughs> and I know a lot of us are starting school again, so I thought that was fitting. But God schools Jonah on mercy. He, he uses these object lessons and these illustrations to, to help him learn about his mercy. So he purposely gave him this plant to teach him a lesson that God is a merciful God, that I am merciful to you, Jonah, but I can also take away everything if I want to. I can do that if I want to. And he, and he causes a worm to come and eat it. And then he causes a scorching hot wind, which was something common back then. Uh, the word they used in the Hebrew was Sirocco, 120 degree east wind that would come through and just be miserable. It would be so hot. And God sent one of those through to get his attention and to school him. And it says here in verse 8, as the sun grew hot, God arranged for the scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. And he says these words that just are so cringy. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. What's interesting is, is Jonah could have left. He didn't have to stay there. He had a life. He, had, he could have left that area, get away from this 
win, but he was waiting there because he wanted to see. What we find out is what he, what he wanted is he wanted to see the city destroyed. And it wasn't coming. And so God is schooling him in mercy. And then verse 9 says, Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. I think that's how he said it. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. The NIV says they don't know their right hand from their left. What does it mean? It just means that they're in a helpless state. They're so lost spiritually that they need someone to intervene on their behalf. This is Ephesians chapter 2. We, we learned that in our series. We were dead in our sin, but God gave us Jesus Christ to rescue us. When we were dead in our sin spiritually, when we were lost, he initiated salvation for us, and then we believe to receive salvation. God gets the last word because he says, not to mention all the animals, shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? The NIV says, shouldn't I have concern for them? Shouldn't I be concerned? We see this in the New Testament. God's heart in the Old Testament has not changed in the New Testament. Ironically, though, Jesus looks over Jerusalem and he says these words in Luke 19, 41 through 44. But as he, as he came closer to Jerusalem, meaning Jonah's people, Jonah's city, and he saw the city ahead, he began to weep. This is Jesus weeping. How I wish today that you, all, uh, that, that you of all people would understand the way to peace. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way of peace. But now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Who is he talking about? Those who did not believe in him as the Messiah, the Son of God. The, the judgment is going to be so great, it would be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah because the living God is right in front of them. And he's done plenty of miracles and healings, but he will do the next sign, and that is the sign of Jonah, the resurrection, the three days coming back to life. Jesus would do that. And those who don't believe, they are doomed. This is the same thing. This is why we preach. This is what we try to share with people. This is God's heart. God grieves for all people. And here we see that God is grieving for his own chosen people, Jesus's. What's the lessons for us in closing? Well, first of all, we learn from our story today that the mission of God doesn't change, we do. Amen? The mission of God has not changed, we change. We must align ourselves. You see, Jonah, Jonah did it. He did what he was supposed to do, but he wasn't really in sync with God's mercy. And, you know, we're all growing. We all need to learn how to be more merciful and gracious. Jonah was not in sync. He didn't do it with the right attitude, with the right spirit. And in 2 Corinthians 19 through 21 says this. Paul says this, For God was in Christ. So when you see Christ, you see God. Reconciling, restoring the world to himself. Bringing it back into a peaceful relationship. That's what Christ was doing on the cross. No longer, ready for this? No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we, Paul's saying, him and all those who are serving, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. 
For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right through Christ. Wow. That message hasn't stopped. And today, we are Christ ambassadors, saying, come home. I want everyone to come back to God, their creator. For me, my faith isn't a matter of religious practice and, and you know, doing the duties of religion. My, my faith is a relationship. And so when people go, man, you're really dedicated to God. You're really into your religion. I'm like, no, I'm really into my creator. It's, for me, it's not a system. It's a relationship with the one who made me. Tell people that. I, yeah, am I devoted to what I do? Absolutely, because I'm devoted to the Lord, my God, my Savior, my Creator. So I make an appeal for people to come back. The mission hasn't changed, but we change. The Word of God doesn't change, we do. You can apply that in many ways, can't you, today? We can't change scripture. We need to submit to it. And the message hasn't changed. Jesus is the only way. We have to share that. We have to conform to the word of God. Again, I'm going to reiterate this. Calvary will not change the word of God to suit people's desires. We will not do that. Because we love people and we want them to know the truth. That's why. Not because we're trying to have some agenda against you. We're for you. We're for your soul. I'm for your soul. There's a reason why I won't move on God's word. I'm for your soul, your eternity. Not for your temporary joy. And so we must conform to the word of God. Jonah's message didn't change. Well, it was God's message, and it didn't change. Once he dealt with Jonah, he said, go back and do the same thing. And it was that message that saved a city. If we give the message of Christ a chance, he will save someone, but we have to go say it. We have to go show it. Pastor Kuhn touched on this beautifully. We must use our words too. Just to encourage you, this is Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. Don't be ashamed. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. It's not your job to, to make someone believe. If we say it, let those who believe, believe. If we, I mean, obviously we want to package it, you know, with some love and some care you don't want to go to a random person and go, believe in the word of God. Well, what is it? I'll tell you after I get done ordering my food here. I mean, we want to package it, right? And he goes on to say this. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. We want to be forgiven. Well, this, this message tells us how. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Thank God. If someone believes in the message you declare, they are made righteous in God's eyes. They're made right and forgiven. John three sixteen through 18. For this is how God loved the world. And if you're listening today, I want you to hear. If you don't know Jesus, please listen. If you've been wondering about this faith, please listen. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. And he says these powerful words, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. 
In other words, we stand condemned already if we don't believe. We have a season of grace, the 40 days to repent and return. Right now in our world, repent and believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. You won't be condemned. You will be saved through Christ. Praise God. So lastly, the word of God doesn't change. We do. The heart of God doesn't change. We do. We must have the heart of God. His heart's not going to change. We're not going to convince him, God, can you go ahead and destroy those people? Go ahead and do that. Okay? Because I'm God, and I, and I think I, I want... No! No one prays that, right? I pray we don't pray that, right? But that's how, that was the attitude of Jonah. That was Jonah's attitude, is he wanted them to be destroyed. God's heart didn't change. He's a merciful, just God. Did he change his plans? Yes, because he saw true, contrite, repentant hearts who were sorry for what they did, and they stopped their evil ways as well. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. We must show mercy, and if we do, we will receive mercy. So let me close with this practical, practical way of showing mercy. One of the reasons why I show mercy even to a waiter or a waitress is because I want them to know Jesus. So I'm going to be, can I get really practical? Just like I mentioned, if you're at a restaurant, give them a break, right? Give them a break. Now, if your food comes out like nasty, I mean, that's a little different, you know, you might have to turn it, turn it back. But do you need to show mercy to your spouse? Think about that for a moment. Let me get real practical. Do you need to show mercy to your spouse? To a friend? To a loved one? Parents, do you need to show mercy to your kids? Kids, give us a break, man. Kids, I love you. I got kids. Kids, come on. Help us out around the house. Show some mercy. Don't, don't let me get away. I don't want to do negotiation deals, you know. If you do this, I'll give you this. Three-year deal. Just, just, just listen. Kids, can you show some mercy to your mom and dad? They're busy. It's been a long, a long week. Are there coworkers and bosses and leaders you need to extend some mercy to? You know, things are really hard right now, aren't they? And complex. People are not only doing life without the hope of Jesus, but they are trying to do life exhausted, confused, and on their own. That's why we love doing Single Moms Day Out. You and I know that if people are trying to do life without Christ, it doesn't go well, does it? Where's the joy? Where's the peace to get through those hard times? That's how we get through. That's how I've been getting through this world right now is the mercy of God, the joy and peace of knowing Christ and the hope of his return and the goodness of God. That's why next week I can't wait to celebrate what God's doing behind the scenes in front of us. So being mindful of those in our day-to-day actions, show patience, show mercy, show grace. Why? Because you want them to know why you're doing that eventually, especially those who are lost. But we also need to show it to our loved ones who are already believers. And the bottom line with that is this. We show God's mercy to a hurting and lost world so they may be saved. That's why God showed mercy. That's why he gave them time to repent. That's why God sent the fish to give Jonah a chance to change. Right now is the time for people to change. Right now is the time to show mercy. Let God do the justice part. Let God do the judging part. And we do the loving part. Amen? He knows what to do. He knows what to do. He is sovereign. He knows what to do. We trust him. And we pray for justice. We pray for mercy. We pray for it all. Amen? So, that's the book of Jonah. 
Jonah and the God of mercy. Let us be merciful and we will be shown mercy. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word today. It's powerful. And God, we conform to your word, our lives. We see the mission. We see your heart. Lord, I pray that you would work in us to do your will on earth. God, wake us up. It's time. Now is the time. God, give us a reminder of your mercy. Help us to show mercy. We thank you for your daily mercies. They're new every day, as Lamentation says. Your mercies are new every day. We thank you for that. We walk in it. We enjoy it, but we also give it out. God, this this story didn't end with a call of action, but we know your heart from the New Testament. You're calling people to come back to you. So we do that through our lives and our words, and we thank you for saving us so that we could still be here helping you save others. We give you all the glory and praise for what you're doing and will do. In Jesus' name, amen.